uh, I will be very uh, bilingual at the beginning at least, uh, if not all along the day. Uh, so, uh, bună dimineața, for those... Good morning. Romanofoni, uh, good morning for the Anglophones, dobri yen. Uh, for the Russophones, we have also interpretation for all these languages. Avem interpretare pentru român. We have interpretation for Romanian, Russian, and English. Canalul do For Romanian, channel 22. And for English, that's one channel. When we speak Romanian, you're going to hear English. And when we speak English, you're going to hear Romanian on that channel. And for Russian, it's channel 25. Um, as we, uh, you see, we, we uh, start uh, very punctually. Uh, and uh, let me uh, just uh, open this, uh, this uh, gathering. Uh, dear friends, colleagues, honorary guests, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second conference in the series, The Causes of uh, Euroscepticism, a series aimed to offer a platform for shedding light on the issues that might affect the credibility of the European Union project and to create a realistic context which will allow us to pave the way for more Europe, for a political Europe. Both my office and I would like to thank you for joining us here today. And we would also like to give a special <laughs> thanks to Mr. Xavier Balzan and Mr. Mikola Obichod for taking the time to come to Brussels and participate in this event. The aim is not for me, as a member of the European Parliament, to place myself on one end or the other of the Euroscepticism debate spectrum. My aim is to be the host of a debate on Euroscepticism at the highest possible European Union political level as an acknowledgement of the growing concerns regarding the future of the European Union. Such a debate should be based on the understanding that Euroscepticism as an idea is neither anti-European nor nationalistic. It is actually an expected reaction towards an European Union which is not living up to its citizens' expectations. In a world where Euroscepticism is growing more and more each day, within the European population and beyond, the last thing the European Union needs is faulty institutions. Today's conference will be focusing on two very separate case studies, both of which will illustrate undemocratic actions, or what appears to be undemocratic actions, and unlawful deeds, or what appear to be unlawful deeds, of the European institutions, namely the structures within the European Commission. This is certainly not an attempt to create an indictment towards the European Commission, nor to negatively influence public opinion, but rather to offer an opportunity to discuss the issues that have put it in a bad light in the hope of finding appropriate solution for all predicaments. One could not possibly rescue one's reputation by putting the garbage under the carpet. Moreover, one should not risk one's reputation on the expense of justice. And I have in mind the reputations of the European institutions, and I repeat it, we should not try to rescue the reputation of the institutions by diminishing the justice or by maltreatments of various persons. Too often we are so much concerned by our image that for the sake of the image, we forget the substance of our work. Within the first panel, our guest, our special guest, is Mr. Xavier Balsan. He 
is the co-owner of the newspaper Malta Today, as well as the owner of the independent media company Media Today, based in San Juan. Mr. Balsan will present the case of former Commissioner John Dali with regards to the European Commission's decisions, which looks today at least unlawful, to dismiss the Commissioner and also to Olaf's investigation procedures and conclusions. I uh, was told uh, that uh, uh, somebody representing Olaf is in the room. I welcome the representatives of Olaf, of course, and uh, we would be keen to listen uh, their opinions if they wish to formulate such op an opinion. In uh, the second panel, following the coffee break, our second honorary guest, Mr. Mikola Obichod, who is currently the first deputy uh, chairman of a nationwide Ukrainian NGOs, I'll come later into details, will talk about double standards found in the contradicting attitude of the European Commission with the reference of cases and um, benchmarks uh, which are raised in order to facilitate the European integration of Ukraine. But this being said, let me give the floor to Mr. Balsan to make his presentation. You have the floor, sir. I thank you for your, for your invitation. Uh, I, I, I had prepared a very lengthy presentation, but since we're very hard on time and I have another appointment, I will have to mention the salient points. Um, I, I'm, I'm obviously a journalist, not a politician, um, and uh, I speak as a journalist and a, somebody who also um, has been working on the, on the, uh, the Dalli case since uh, basically the 15th of October. And uh, I believe we were the uh, crucial in, 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 uh, in uncovering the inconsistencies, the, the double standards, and I would also say the connivance between institutions of both countries, of, I mean, of, of, the European, of the European Union and the Maltese government at the time, and also of having also revealed the Olaf report and revealed many other things which were kept under wraps. I have to also declare that I am not a Eurosceptic. I was involved in 2002, between 1999 and 2002, in campaigning for Malta's accession into the European Union at the forefront of a campaign group of an NGO as an independent journalist, but also saying that we must be in Europe. Today, if I had to return, rewind to that period after having experienced the last six months, I don't think I would have decided to be there. I am, to say the least, disillusioned. But let me talk about this. This is not a presentation about what you can read very easily uh, about the whole saga of what was called Dalligate. Um, because that is something you can easily find on the internet in great detail. On our site alone, there is more than there are at least 60,000 words, timeline, precise details of statements, counter statements, revelations, etc., etc. On other websites, various websites, there is also very detailed information. Today, I come to talk not about delegate. This is not about delegate. This is perhaps something else, perhaps it should be called Kessler Gate or Barroso Gate or Tobacco Gate. But I come to show you the way the institutions, when they have ulterior motives, work together to reach an end. And in reaching an end, they, 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 they forget about where they started from and where they want to go. Um, I will mention a lot of names, so of those of you who are particularly interested, they can email, my email is, is, is public domain, and I can send them a bio of the people. I have to mention these names, because without mentioning the names, you will be completely lost. Let's go back, and I have a limited amount of time, let's go back to the famous, the famous date, 17th October, right? When Giovanni Kessler decided to, to have a press conference, and during that press conference, he probably... Um, he probably determined two important angles, two important angles to the new way judicial, judicial processes are, are presented in a, in a normal society. This is 2013, that was 2012, and it was, a sh it was shameful. 
The first thing he, pr he brought to, to the fore, the word circumstantial evidence. And in normal judicial processes, circumstantial evidence is no evidence at all. Mr. Kessler comes from Italy, where the judiciary in Italy present cases on circumstantial evidence, and many times, and more often, their judiciary processes are shown to be faulty. But he did more than that. He basically, and I quote also what other people have said who are not at all related to either my media organization or to, to any political group which is Eurosceptic, Inga Gressler, he basically, in his words, basically presented John Dalli as guilty before innocent. He basically gave the perception that the man was corrupt and that the man had done wrong and that, he, that the circumstantial evidence which he did not talk about, which he did not talk about, was in fact evidence enough, one, on an ethical, political, ethical issue, and the second, the second was because, because there was evidence which could possibly point out to bribery, trading of influence, etc., etc. We did not know what he was talking about, but he was so, so determined, so sure of himself, not to be asked, not to be questioned, that we are we expected to believe him. On the day of his press conference, Maltese journalists do not ever cover. We don't even have a resident Maltese journalist. There was one, he's no longer there. Surprisingly, state TV, we have to understand that in Malta now we have a new government. Before we had a, a Christian democratic government, which was at odds with Mr. Dalli. He was in fact kicked upstairs because he was a threat to the then prime minister. Sent one of the most anti-Dalli TV present journalists to this press conference. How he knew about the press conference before makes one wonder. And from there, we started to wonder, us in the back seat in our newsrooms, what was happening. We also started to hear different, different sounds. John Daly returned to Malta very soon after, and he said, I did not resign. I was forced to resign. Mr. Barroso insisted that this was not the case. We had two versions, whom to believe. Interestingly, we found out other things, that on the 5th of October, 15th of October, Mr. Barroso meets Mr. Dalli. On the 5th of October, Prime Minister Gonzi, the Prime Minister of the time, he's no longer Prime Minister, met Mr. Barroso. And during that time, there is communication between the office of Mr. Barroso and Olaf, this is documented, asking them, when is the report going to be ready? It is completely unlikely. It is totally unlikely that Prime Minister Gonzi did not know, did not know what, um, did not know what um, was happening in the case of Dalli, and I will explain why. One has to understand the Maltese context. Mr. Dalli was considered to be a threat to a threat to Prime Minister Gonzi. 2012, to you it may mean, mean nothing, but in 2012 there were various votes of no confidence in the Maltese Parliament. And in January 2012, at the same time, parallel to the Dopeco Directive being processed in all the procedures are here, which I do not understand, and I wish not to understand, they thought that Mr. Daly was going to return to Malta to, candid, to be a candidate against Mr. Gonzi. He opened up his candidature. And from the European Parliamentary Office in Malta, the European Parliamentary Office in Malta, blogs were being organized against Mr. Dalli about his past, about allegations of corruption, etc., etc. These chats, this, these blogs have been presented to the police, and the police in 2012 did nothing to investigate them. What was more interesting as time went by is that one of the most ardent supporters of Prime Minister Gonzi was the permanent representative of Malta in Brussels. He was also unbelievably, you have to remember, Malta is a very small country where, where resources are limited and everybody has about three hats. Was also the strategist of the party that Prime Minister Gonzi, Prime Minister Gonzi had. And this person, Richard Kakea Caruana, this person, he faced a vote of no confidence, unbelievable vote of no confidence, never happened in, in, in the history, I think, a vote of no confidence in the permanent representative in Brussels, for allegedly having colluded with the Americans 
over the issue of partnership for peace. And the parliament voted against him because there was one backbencher with the Christian Democrat government who voted against him, and he lost his seat. Now, what does this have to do with Mr. Dalli? Well, this is like a scene from, from some novel, from some, some uh, dubious, dirty novel. Richard Kakea Karwana had asked Mr. Dalli to support him. And Mr. Dalli, on record, this has been published, told him, I cannot support you. I cannot support you on this. Now, let's go back a little bit. Richard Kakea Karwana was the person who, who pulled all the strings. Permanent representative, cabinet secretary, relations between the EU and Malta. He was the one who pushed the internal audit officer in Malta, called Rita Schembri, to be the head of the equivalent of Olaf in Malta, called the AID, a certain Rita Schembri. She was also, she was also proposed by and pushed by Jessica K. Caruana to be on the supervisory committee of Olaf. And all of a sudden, st things start to take place. When, on the 17th of October, Kessler made his press conference, we started to investigate. And we started to find out who this Rita Schembri was. Rita Schembri was the person who met Kessler in Malta, who welcomed Kessler in Malta. The conversations between Kessler and Rita Schembri are unknown. But Rita Schembri, being in what we call then the Gonzi camp, obviously painted not a very nice picture of Mr. Dalli, giving Mr. Kessler to believe, and I, I, am, I think I'm justified in a free country to believe, to say that Mr. Kessler seems to be a very gullible person. If that is libelous, then we have a problem in this new society. Seems to have believed that he had a big fish in his hands. Mr. Rita Schembri was not only in cahoots with her imagination, she was also in cahoots with people in the Gonzi administration. Now, we did not know all this. We got to know all this because, coincidentally, we found out that Rita Schembri, and I say this with absolute fact, was in fact a crook. She used her AID office, which was supposed to audit EU funds, to have business links with people involved in EU funds. And we, parallel to this, investigated this. And all of a sudden, we realized who the Rita Schembri was, her role in the supervisory committee, her role that she did not even tell the supervisory committee that she was involved in the interrogation, interrogation of this famous Silvio Zamit, who was supposed to be this lobbyist, this lobbyist who led Mr. Dalli to the Big Apple. Now, let me just rush through all this. There is so much to say that I, don't, I would need two days, three days, and I would probably be talking by myself. When Mr. Kessler decided to visit Malta and meet the Silvio Zamit, who has a small pizzeria by the seaside, and is given the impression that he's been some big entrepreneur when he's really not at all an entrepreneur, but a small businessman wanting maybe to make a very quick buck. He did not even tell Mr. Silvio Zamit why he was there. So much so, and this I quote, Mr. Zamit thought that Mr. Kessler Talk to, was talking to talk to him about some bakery, EU funds on making bread. He had absolutely no idea. He invited Mr. Kessler to have a coffee and what not. He talked to Rita Schembri in Maltese and asked him what this is all for, and she told him, don't worry, don't worry. And at no point did he know that he was being interrogated. He had even no idea who Olaf was. I personally did not even know who Olaf was before this whole thing started. And I guess that 99.9% .9 of all European citizens do not even know who Olaf is or what Olaf is all about. So at the end of the day, the Silvio Zamit, who last week, in fact, presented a judicial protest in the Maltese courts, saying more than that, saying that not only did he not know that he was being interrogated, that he did not sign any of the statements that were being presented to him, unlike what is said in the Olaf report. But let me now rush through things. Malta is a country where before 9th March 2013, and I'm not saying this might not repeat itself today, state TV and most of the media was pro-government and literally gatekeeping. So we had a situation where the real discussion, debate on John Dalli was impossible. State TV against John Dalli. Why? Because it was on the industry of Gonzi. Blogs against John Dalli. Newspapers against John Dalli. And we were basically the only independent organization asking questions. But what was more important, that we started getting very serious, serious, serious information from the police. That the police were in cahoots, and this I have written several times, and I will reveal more things today, 
before I conclude, because I, I'm sure I'm going to exceed my time. The police were in cahoots with the office of the Prime Minister, who obviously knew exactly what was happening from Olaf, and pressing the police, you must prosecute John Dalli. You must prosecute John Dalli. In the interrogations with John Dalli, the Commission of Police, together with two other officers, used, I wouldn't say extreme force, but they, they took the commissioner and put him in a cell for the night to put pressure on him. In the interrogations with Silvio Zamit and all the other people, they even put pressure, and we have now confirmation because of the judicial process, that they told these people, admit, admit, Mr. Dalli accepted flus, accepted money, sorry, flus is money in Maltese, I'm so sorry about this, uh, accepted money, accepted money, asked for money, and none of these people who were interrogated independently admitted either on duress or willingly. And yet, the Commissioner of Police, in his what we would call the police meeting monitoring report, continued to insist, continued to insist that Mr. Dalli must be prosecuted. Because obviously, for the Gonzi administration, and now I will mention something else, which had just lost a vote of no confidence, a budget vote, and was going to go to the election, the idea of having Mr. Dalli handcuffed going to court would have been a brownie point. All this, all this happened based on one simple conclusion by Mr. Kessler and his team based on circumstantial evidence. What Mr. Kessler did not do, and it shows to what extent, and again, I have the right to express my opinion, I believe, in a free society, even though I feel at the times I'm freer, freer in Malta than in, in Brussels. Mr. Kessler did not show that on that particular day when the phone calls happened with Silvio Zamit, Mr. Silvio Zamit, a prolific telephone caller, had also called and spent long time, a long time, with other political figures discussing political issues. In Malta, we have this very bad habit of discussing politics ad nauseum, including a former tourism minister, the, pre the environmental minister of the time, the secretary general of the Nationalist Party, the Christian Democrat Party, but Mr. Kessler, specifically in the Olaf report, mentioned these things out of context, giving the impression that, hey, this is the only thing that happened during that day. And therefore, he led people to obviously the golden path, to the, as we would say, to the to give the impression that, that there was this amazing, amazing uh, plan with the connivance, obviously, of John Dalli, and therefore, ethically and, 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 and on, on, a judicial, on a judicial level, Mr. Dalli should be, should be prosecuted. There are a number of things which I can go on talking about. But I should mention one important thing. In the Olaf report, Mr. Kessler makes it very clear that Gail Kimberly, one of the lobbyists involved, should be prosecuted. And what is very strange, and I mention in this presentation, which you may take, and you may, you may have a copy of, and I can send you my email, which contains all the, the details, should be prosecuted. But at no point did the Maltese police, then or after, then or after, decide to prosecute Gail Kimberley. Why? The question is very interesting. I talk about Gail Kimberley's family being a very influential family in Malta. I talk about the fact that Gail Kimberley at the time was also close to the office of the Prime Minister, having been also offered a job with the office of Prime Minister, and she only, and she only refused because she was told it's not a good idea because if there's a change of government you will lose your job, etc., etc. I will just read out the presentation, the last part of the presentation, if you don't mind. On a June, the new Commissioner of Police, because I have a new Commissioner of Police now, a new Commissioner of Police who does not, who does not take orders, hopefully, and I believe that this is the case, take all, from politicians what to do, from the Office of the Prime Minister what to do, stated, as things stand, there is no evidence to incriminate John Dalli. He said that he had already 
consulted with the Attorney General of Malta, Peter Gregg, who, by the way, before, had said that there is. And he agreed, the Attorney General agreed with this assessment, there was no evidence to incriminate John Dully. Obviously, John Dully took a great sigh of relief and wondered how he's going to rebuild his life. On Kessler's investigation probe, not my words, the Maltese Commissioner of Police, Peter Paul Zamit, said, I would have been kicked out of office had he acted in the same way as Giovanni Kessler. If I were acting in the same manner in my position, I would be risking getting kicked out of office. In Malta, the culture of resignations and ethical responsibility is much, much higher than in Brussels. And I'm proud of this. After, being, after Malta has been taken to the gutter, to the gutter, by a former Italian magistrate who, who, who has a problem with putting words to his mouth, yes, I am proud to say that our ethical standards and our idea of political responsibility is much higher. It is a consolation that Kessler is not Maltese because it seems that only Maltese are allowed to take responsibility and to, believe, and to be responsible for their actions. I have some conclusions or questions that I should ask. One, Kessler did not know the extent, and this is, I think, fair to say, of Dali's political threat to Gonzi, the Maltese premier, until, until 9th, 9th March. And therefore interpreted or did not read the overenthusiasm at every level in Malta whenever the word Dali was mentioned. When the word Dali was mentioned, obviously, it was like a scene of the exorcist. Kessler is obvious, and it's my opinion, I'm in a free society, I believe. Believe, I believe, wanted to have a big kill. Bringing down a commissioner is no big joke. He will be remembered for making a big kill and making a big mistake, perhaps. Kessler, and this is not my words, ignored what is normal political Judicial procedures. Judicial is, in, in its innocence, the presumption of innocence. And with his words, demolished, gave the perception that Dali was guilty as hell. The police commissioner, the former police commissioner, John Ritzow, who would spend time telling people to admit to something they, did, they could not admit to, came to Brussels over the Olaf report. We do not know what was said then. And it would be interesting to know what was said then with officials from Olaf. Barroso has shown animosity towards Dali from the very beginning. Why? Because Dali was not a yes man. He was never a political yes man, even in the political system. And perhaps in the UN institutions, maybe in the commission, it is expected that you need a yes man. Dali was someone who spoke very clearly. There was a Libyan crisis, he spoke of it very clearly perhaps making a mistake, but he spoke his mind, he spoke what he felt was the truth. And it's important to remember one important point. In 2004, Dali was forced to resign by Premier Gonzi, again on a fabricated report, on a fabricated report, on a fabricated report, and he resigned. And, it, and the person who fabricated the report, thanks to Maltese justice, thanks to Maltese justice, was sentenced to two years imprisonment. But Dali, Dali resigned, took political responsibility. Barroso took exceptional tolerance to the entrapment mechanism by the tobacco industry and the way his Secretary General Catherine Day acted. It is incredible, it is incredible how this happened. And Barroso doesn't accept Surprising, doesn't appear to be in a hurry to get this tobacco directive implemented. At least, I don't see it implemented by 2014. And it seems that if you look at the original and you look at what's happening today, there is an element of watering down. I end here by saying one simple thing. The Dali affair, which I prefer to call the Kessler gate, or the Barroso gate, or the tobacco gate, has disillusioned many observers, especially many Maltese, about the EU institutions, about where we want to go. We believe, and I am the first one to believe, that Europe and the European Union must be there and must continue to be there. But if we are not going to take also political responsibility at all levels for their mistake, for our mistakes, then I believe it can't be only the small countries, such as Malta, who take the responsibility for, 
for issues which might be related not to bribery, trading of influence, but maybe a misunderstanding of how, how fragile you can be in the face of big and unnoticed interests. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Balzan. It sounds like a political thriller, uh, the story you have uh, you know, presented here. Uh, I must uh, inform the audience uh, that, uh, um, indeed, um, for several times, uh, the general director of uh, OLAF uh, was uh, invited and able to present his uh, position, uh, but this happened behind closed doors uh, in front of our uh, um, budgetary control uh, committee. And um, certainly, uh, certainly uh, this is an issue which uh, is already public. Um, probably some of you know, some of you do not know that uh, the media in various countries, not only the media in Brussels, reflected from the very beginning uh, the problems related to this uh, very, very troubling uh, issue. Um, as far as I know, some hundreds of questions uh, were tabled by the members of the European Parliament in an attempt, in, I would say in a desperate attempt, to discover the truth. Uh, and certainly we are not going today, we are not able today to discover this truth, but uh, anyhow I think that by you know, expressing views we could progress towards the truth. As far as I'm concerned, I got completely irrelevant answers to my questions. And as far as I know, the most, if not all, the members got the same kind of irrelevant answers. At the beginning, I passed the, 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 the information. I don't know if, uh, if it was passed to all of you. I forgot to repeat it from the chair, that uh, in order to save time, uh, I um, uh, well, now We'll come back with my opinions about that, but uh, I want to save time now, and uh, if you have questions, uh, Mr. Balzan will be, I'm sure, happy to answer for a few minutes because he has to, to leave. I ask you to put the questions in writing. We received some questions uh, already um, by mail these days, so um, you have papers in front of you, and this is going to be also for the second part of this meeting. Uh, in order to save time, just put your questions in writing. Of course, if somebody wants to put it orally, to make it orally, or to make some remarks orally, uh, you, you could also do that. Uh, well, now I receive few questions. Uh, I will, do you, do you want to read them, or it's? I'll try and read them. Do you consider that Dali's case is an exception uh, of the rule, or is it a structural conduct that characterizes the European institutions? Well, I I, I really have to say that, that I am not a, I am, I am unaware of the, I mean, the whole, the whole procedure, um, even the, the whole issue of Olaf was, was completely new to me, and um, we had absolutely no, I didn't even know, for example, that there was an internal audit office in Malta. Uh, today I know, it's very interesting that today I know, because, because the, the same, the, the former chief of the internal audit officer, her business partner, was one of the main, uh, one of the, what had a business interest in the tuna industry, which was heavily, for example, audited by, the, by, by, by Olaf. You can imagine, you can imagine what a report that was. So, I mean, I was unaware of even the existence of, um, most citizens and most journalists, at least far away from Brussels, are unaware of, of, uh, of uh, the, the way the European Union structures would work. It's only when we experience these things that we get to know about, about the way uh, the whole system is far from, from watertight or far, or, or far from, from, from uh, proper in the way it, it functions. Yes, well, we have another one. What could be, according to you, the suitable way to repair the, the consequences of the justice to Mr. Dalli in preventing similar cases? Well, the only thing I, the only thing I, I can say is that, is that uh, in Malta, the, the, uh, whether, whether one likes it or not, the, the uh, um, five days, four days, I believe five days after the police commissioner announced, announced um, that there was no incriminating evidence against Mr. Dalli, the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, uh, appointed Mr. Dalli to be a special advisor 
He was a former health minister. He was a EU Commissioner of Health as a special, a special advisor and consultant on health reform in Malta. So on a level, on a Maltese political level, he, there is an acknowledgement that, that the man, that the person has a validity and the person should be reintegrated into, into society. But as I, as I say, I'm getting the impression that, that our system is far more just and far more, far more proper than, than the institutions which, uh, and uh, the interests uh, here in Brussels. And I'm not saying this is Eurosceptic, I'm saying this, I'm saying, I'm not at all a Eurosceptic, I'm saying this as we perceive this, uh, 2,000 uh, kilometers south on the small island of Malta, which was, was treated in a very different way than other countries are usually treated. Well, very two technical questions, I believe. Were there any judicial, was it against, against Dalli in a way to political responsibility and resigned. No, there's, there's absolutely no, I mean, circumstantial, circumstantial evidence is, is not, circumstantial evidence is not uh, evidence unless it is linked with other hard evidence which, which points to, which points to uh, someone being, I either have criminal intent, there are various obviously difficult, dif different regimes, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I think uh, I understand the presumption of innocence much more than Mr. Kessler. Okay, the last one, the last one. What is the current situation, Mr. Dali, in, in Malta? I have explained to what extent was he affected by this affair. Well, he was accept, accepted to this affair in, this, in the sense that I think his political career came to, a, to an, an abrupt end. Perhaps not to an ab abrupt end. You never know. You never say no. I know that the man himself suffered some very serious medical uh, conditions. He spent at least six to seven weeks in a, in, a, in, a, in a clinic, I believe either in Belgium or in Germany. I don't know exactly where. Um, but I, um, there are, in, in, a, in, in many countries, you find very few people who are capable of actioning things or implementing things. You find this in all political systems and all societies. John Daly was one of those persons who was able. He probably had a lot of also, uh, he made some big misjudgments in his political career, I have no doubt. He was not, definitely, I don't think he was a virgin like many other politicians. But he was somebody... And I think for record, it should be, for, probably is in the Gunnins Book of Records. He introduced VAT in Malta twice in 1996. It was removed by then a very short-lived Labour government and to reintroduce it again in 1998. I don't believe this was ever the case. And he suffered politically for introducing what in most countries is considered to be a just tax. And, and, uh, and on that level also, he introduced various reforms which were extremely unpopular. Uh, linked to privatization, linked to, linked to also reforms in the health sector in Malta, which obviously make po politicians less popular. Um, okay, are, are there a, a, any other questions uh, from the room? Yes, please. You can uh, speak Romanian, you can, you can speak any language. You can speak any language. Yes. Um, I would rather speak English. I'm a physicist and a computer scientist and a European citizen. I would like to say something regarding Mr. Dali's case. This is a lobbying problem here in the European institutions. The lobbyists try to influence certain decisions through any means. What I want to say is that these lobbyists have to be controlled to a certain extent. I know there's a mandatory register for lobbyists and my question is how can you show, how can somebody know uh, what the role of the lobbyist was in this problem of Mr. Dali's. Yeah, the lobbyists uh, in European Parliament, if you don't agree with them, you can have great problem, and they are influencing the decision of the commissioner. And this must be controlled, because if you have a lobby, you might take the pro and the contra decisions that you want to 
take that's very clear and they don't do it and the lobby are belong, belong to the European Commission because they are receiving the money from that, you know. So what is the position, what is the role would the lobby was doing in this case? I give you another example for lobbying. One moment. The um, genetic modified plants, uh, plant, they were accepted by the Commission to introduce it in Europe against all the population they don't want. And you have a, lo a very large petition now, European citizen initiative, they are against them. They are lobbying, who are doing this, influences this decision. Again, I'm not, a, I, I'm not, I'm not a, an authority to talk about, about the influence of lobbies. All I can say, all I can say is that before this, this uh, episode, I had absolutely no idea of, of, of how strong and what, uh, um, what impact this would have on the tobacco, on the tobacco industry. Uh, I, had, I had no idea the, the, the turnovers we are talking about. And when I see the, the, uh, the, the turnovers in the, of the tobacco industry in Europe, and one, one understands why uh, there was such great interest in not seeing the tobacco directive, uh, either having the tobacco, the tobacco directive watered down or, or else having it postponed. By having it postponed by just two years or even three years, um, European Parliament elections will be up in 2014. So probably it won't even pass by 2014. It will mean another year of unbridled uh, tobacco uh, uh, use. And so... From our point of view, we only start to realize the strength of these lobbies because of, these, because of this event. Okay, uh, I, I got also a question uh, and I read it. Uh, Mr. Barroso has declared that no matter if Mr. Dali is innocent or not, in the conditions of the scandal that has appeared after the complaint of a Swedish tobacco company, politically speaking, Mr. Dali could not remain member of the Commission. From this declaration, it results that the political impediment, impediment was independent of the innocence or guilt of Mr. Dali. How do you comment this uh, reasoning? I don't know. Uh, would you like to comment on that? It was addressed to me, but I gladly pass it no, to you. No, I, mean, I, I have to conclude. Uh, uh, I, have to, I have to conclude here because of, of okay, time. Uh, but uh, no, no. I, I think I think one of the, the one of the uh, situations over there uh, comparisons is that there were other commissioners who. Uh, who uh, were uh, involved in uh, uh, more serious uh, reports or allegations of, um, of not of impropriety, but of uh, having met, although there, were, there was a case of one case of impropriety. I believe that, 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 uh, that Mr. Barroso would not have acted in the same way if John Dalli, uh, unfortunately I have to say this, I have nothing against the, uh, being German, but was a German, German, uh, was a German commissioner, and he would have acted quite differently, knowing that Mr. Dali was not supported, if Mr. Dali was supported by his own prime minister, which he was not. And he would have acted in a different way if he had known that the members of parliament in the European Parliament from the Maltese side would have supported Mr. Dali. It's a completely different ball game. He knew exactly the history and behind Mr. Dali that he was not supported by his prime minister, not supported by his party, and therefore he had an easy ball game. Uh, as far as I know, Mr. Balzan has to catch a train for, uh, you know, uh, having a meeting in Paris. So uh, whenever you want to, to leave us, uh, you are free to do that. Thank you so much for, for being friend. present uh, with us today. We will continue for a few minutes uh, if somebody else wants to take the floor, and I will answer. Thank and you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will answer myself to the question addressed to me, and we will conclude and we'll take uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, break before changing the panels on the podium. Uh, well, uh, indeed, this is something which I was told by many people. Whatever happened, whatever happened, Mr. Dali was in the impossibility, political impossibility to stay. Because once the scandal erupted, once the accusations were formulated, uh, he, had, he was in a bad position and the Commission uh, was uh, shadowed by or could have been shadowed by this scandal and therefore Mr. Dali had to quit. Well, this means that we might ask somebody who is innocent to quit 
simply because we do not want to defend the innocent one. I wonder if this is what our taxpayers wants, want or what our voters want. Because uh, Mr. Dali or any other commissioner or members of the parliament are here as a result of some people, some Europeans, voting somewhere in this continent. Of course, the commissioners are elected by the parliament, but nevertheless, the parliament is elected by the people. And uh, certainly, the people want, I believe, that the guilty ones quit and the innocent stay. So from my point of view, this argument, which I heard time and again here in the European institution, does not speak for the rule of law, does not speak for our values, does not speak for our duty to respond to the legitimate expectations of our citizens. We have to defend the innocence. We have to investigate and to um, convict, according to our competencies, the guilty ones. But if we start convicting the innocent, the, the innocence, or if we start getting rid of innocence, as, or as it was in the uh, letter of invitation, we start assassinating our colleagues, simply politically assassinating, simply because we do not want to take the risk of defending them. Maybe because by defending them we might, you know, open the temptations of some to look in our own wrongdoings, which were well covered before. I believe that this is an opinion on a position which could not be accepted. So we have to confront, if you want, the public opinion. We have to confront the media rumors, if necessary, and to say in a very open, transparent, straightforward dialogue what we really believe. We have also the right to believe in something. And the institutions have to defend their people as long as they believe that these people are innocent. So this argument is a scandal. He, has to, he had to quit, Mr. Dali had to quit because uh, otherwise we had problems, we would have had problems of, uh, of reputation. I don't think that this is the right approach. Well, is there anybody else to want to, to, to raise a question? Okay, please, the last one. I want to give you as much uh, opportunities as possible. Yeah, uh, just uh, a question. Uh, don't you consider that Mr. Dali has also some responsibilities in this democratic slide? Because when you have de democracy is having rights and using it, and you have to know it to use it, and there is a code of conduct for commissioners, and in this code of conduct, it says that if there is a possible conflict of interest for a commissioner, there should be a discussion between the president of the commission and the, the, the commissioner to decide to withdraw this file from his portfolio, just to be sure that he will act uh, good uh, regarding this file. So don't you think that finally, if Mr. Dali knew, because I, I guess he didn't know that, because he would have used it if he could have used it. He could have said to Barroso when he was uh, asked to come to, to his office, okay, you feel like I have a conflict of interest, so please withdraw this, fly, this file from my portfolio, and I will say. So what do you think about this? Because the, there is a code of conduct, and it's the same for MEPs, and I don't think that MEPs know the code of conduct, for instance. There are many, many rules that are not applied just because the people don't know the rules. What do you think about that? Well, if there are rules, they have to be applied. I, I am not an investigator of the Dali case, and I'm going to say that in the conclusion, in concluding this, uh, this uh, part of the meeting. So I cannot judge, and I will never say he is guilty or he is not guilty. He was or he was not in the conflict of interest. At this point in time, we are speaking about some principles. You know, could we ask somebody who is innocent, you know, to take responsibility for not being guilty? Could we convict or accuse somebody on the basis of uh, collateral or indirect or uh, what do you call circumstantial evidences? These are a few things, and I'm going to come back to, to, to them. Of course, if uh, there was an article of uh, the rules which had to be applied, 
And uh, of course, if Mr. Dali would have been, uh, let's say, subject of the application of that article, she should have been, she should have proceeded accordingly. Accordingly, this is out of question. This is out of question. But was he in that situation? I don't know. Anyhow, anyhow, I believe that there are enough. I don't. I don't say that uh, whatever was said here, it's uh, it's uh, the, the pure truth. What I am struck is the fact that I hear these things again and again. Then uh, the explanations which we hear are less and less convincing. That indeed it was said, as it was in the previous question, that irrespective of what he did, he has to quit because politically he, is an un he has an unsustainable position. I don't know if you had this in mind when you put your question, but I don't think that the rules uh, to which you made reference, had in mind, you know, to ask somebody to leave without being guilty simply because this makes our life easier. Simply because uh, by that we avoid giving explanation to the people. Now, we are obliged to give explanation to the people every day. Of course, people might trust us or distrust us. But I'm sure that at the end of the day, they the distrust will be bigger if we simply, as I said, assassinate or eliminate our innocent colleagues simply because we want to leave the people believe that we are, you know, athletes of the fight against uh, whatever, corruption or conflict of interest or, or, or whatever. So the rules are there, we have to apply the rules, but we have to apply the rules properly in accordance with the scope for which those rules were adopted. And I don't believe that the scope of the rules you have mentioned is that the President of the Commission could ask a Commissioner to resign only because uh, he has not uh, the envy to defend his colleague. Okay? This is the answer I, I could give you. Uh, certainly, well, I must say I want to conclude this part of, of the meeting, if you don't mind. Well, the name of uh, Mr. Kessler was uh, mentioned several times. Um, I am quite uneasy about that. Uh, of course, it was unavoidable, but perhaps. But I am quite uneasy because uh, I know uh, for a long while Mr. Kessler, she was uh, my colleague and I would say close collaborator within the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the OECE when I was a president of that assembly and uh, I remember Mr. Kessler as being a honest uh, committed, uh, intelligent, uh, value-oriented member of the Italian Parliament and that capacity, in that capacity of, uh, of uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the OECE. So um, I'm still looking for that uh, Giovanni Kessler, uh, and I hope that he still exists. But uh, certainly the way in which this case was handled uh, raises a number of questions. And I think that the first step in order to regain the trust of the people is at least to accept that these questions are valid. One of the questions indeed refers to the fact that conclusions were drawn on the basis of circumstantial evidences. I fully agree that circumstantial evidences are imported only if linked with hard judicial evidences. Only circumstantial evidences, indirect evidences, are not uh, able or not, uh, they, they, cannot, they cannot entitle any conclusion and certainly not any accusation, any breach of, uh, of the um, benefit of doubt. I think that one could expect at least from the anti-fraud office as presumably independent, unbiased investigative organ to immediately admit that circumstantial evidences cannot supersede the presumption of innocence or counteract the benefit of the doubt. It is not for the accused, I think we have to say again, to prove his innocence, but for the accuser to prove his guilt proof of which has not been presented by anyone so far in the case of Commissioner Dali. What is more, 
following Olaf's leaked investigation report on John Dali's case, because unfortunately I cannot understand that. These reports are secret. This reminds me of another case which is famous also with D starting, it's Dreyfus case. Dreyfus was convicted on the basis of evidences which were not public. So only the judges saw the evidences, not the, the indicted person. So uh, um, anyhow, this report leaked shows the fact that none of its chapters link Mr. Dali to the bribing attempt, and this contradicts the conclusion of the report submitted to Mr. Barroso. I also think, as I said already, that resignation should be asked only to guilty people. If an innocent person is required to leave the post, what is a guilty person supposed to do? As I said, I forward several answers. I have one of them here, uh, several questions. I have one of them here, which is quite breathtaking. It says that Olaf basically does not exist because it is a unit without, without legal personality. Having no legal personality, he, it has no responsibility. But as we see, it has a tremendous impact on the credibility of the institutions and eventually, I think it's not so unimportant, on the destiny of human beings. Because in the end, Mr. Dali is also a human being. And there are some other human beings which could be, who could be effect, affected by, by such conclusions. So uh, there is no legal personality. There is no direct responsibility. It is a res the only one who, answer, who could answer for Olaf is the European Commission, but Mr. Barroso explained to me that this European Commission does not have any look in the affairs of Olaf. So Olaf does not exist legally because it has no legal personality. It's not supervised by the Commission who has a legal personality. Yes, it is also explained by Mr. Barroso in the answer sent to me that Olaf's conclusions do not put in question the presumption of innocence or the benefit of doubt, which means that in this case, Mr. Barroso admits that Mr. Dali was asked to resign while his presumption of innocence was completely valid because it was not put in question by Olaf. And against this decision, there is no rule uh, no, no any uh, legal recourse. What is about the rule of law in the end? What is about the rule of law? I must say, and I end here, that even if it's so vague and inexistent, Olaf is present in our life. And I remember a report of Olaf complaining about the lack of cooperation of the Romanian prosecutors. There is apparently a representative of this inexisting uh, person, Olaf, in the headquarters of the Romanian prosecutions. And they are cooperating, which means that the preliminary investigation of Olaf should be confirmed by the final investigation of national prosecutors. And there are some prosecutors who complain about pressures exercised on them. I cannot investigate, I cannot say this is true or not, if this is true or not, but I ask myself if this is very much in line with our conception, concept of rule of law and supremacy of law. So we cannot judge, we are not going to trial anybody here, we could only raise questions. And as I said, the fact that we dare to raise these questions is the first step towards recovering the credibility in front of our citizens. We certainly would recover this credibility only when we get appropriate answers to these questions, and more so when we get real measures and steps in order to improve these things. I don't want to blame anybody, any person, and, or any institution. I simply want to ask everybody to stay without any prejudice together at the same table and to find solution in order to rehabilitate the real spirit of the rule of law 
of which we are so proud and about which we, sp we speak so much and uh, in respect of which we are always ready to lecture the others. About these others, we will talk in a few minutes. I will uh, ask you to stay maybe and to enjoy your coffee if you get uh, some uh, for five minutes until we invite uh, the next speaker to uh, address another interesting case, this time a case which is uh, um, you know, uh, situated, placed outside of the European Union, but I think that the reputation of the Union should be defended also outside these borders. So um, thank you so much. We close here this part of, uh, of, uh, of our meeting, and uh, I invite the next uh, guest to um, we'll stay here. We'll remain my channel. Okay. So, uh, to, to come and uh, we'll continue in five minutes. Just five minutes sitting break. Salom, cinci minute pause. Short five minute break now.
Um, so let's uh, let's uh, start. Hai să începem încet ca să. Let us begin. Slowly, slowly, let's start our procedures. Uh, as I um, already announced, the second uh, part is uh, is um, going to deal with um, a different case. We could call it uh, Timoshenko case. Uh, for uh, this part, uh, we have another guest speaker. This is Mr. Mikola Obichod. He is the deputy head of the Center for Strategic Studies and Analysis in Ukraine, and also uh, the first deputy chairman of a nationwide Ukrainian uh, non-governmental organization called Strength and Honor. From the outset, I want to say that uh, my deep belief, and I hope that you will share this point of view, is that this House is not a court of justice. Even some other houses hosting some other European institutions are not courts of justice. And I think that uh, an indictment, a possibly criminal act, should, not only should, must be judged, must be trialed by a judicial court. I believe that this is one of the basic rules which are part of the more general concept of rule of law. So therefore, in this house we cannot stay if a certain former Prime Minister, let's say Mrs. Timoshenko, the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, is guilty or she is not guilty. But as far as we cannot say this about any other Prime Minister, because it seems that it's very fashionable nowadays to trial the prime ministers in Europe. Unfortunately, it is not me and not us who made judicial decisions without being judges within institutions which are not courts of justice. If uh, I have to put it like that, in this house, and not only, the European institutions apparently decided that a former Ukrainian Prime Minister, Mrs. Timoshenko, is not guilty for the accusation the judiciary system in Ukraine brought against her, while another Prime Minister, namely the Romanian Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister, Mr. Nastase, he is guilty. So, uh, moreover, it was asked therefore, for the Ukrainian political authorities to release Mrs. Timoshenko, while the same European institutions ask the Romanian authorities not to release Mr. Nastasi. So it's quite strange when we start to make justice without being a judicial institution. As I said, I don't claim today and I didn't claim yesterday, and I won't claim tomorrow, that one or another of these people are guilty or not guilty. I have my opinions based on some information, but it's hard from this microphone to give a, set, uh, a final sentence. But it is unacceptable when some try to be judges without being entitled to be judges, and without having all evidence is on their table. This is not only a matter of, uh, let's say, human uh, interest. This is not about the destiny, and we speak again, about destiny of human of people. But it is also a political, it has a political and a geopolitical consequence, and I come back to the Ukrainian case. Because it is not a secret that the agreement, the association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine 
so badly needed by Ukraine and by the European Union, so sorrowly negotiated between the Ukrainian representatives and the European Union representatives, is not to be signed and ratified and bring into um, power, into force, without the release of Mrs. Timoshenko. This is what it has been expressed publicly, clear and loud. So this means that we have judged the case, we have uh, drawn a conclusion, and we transform that conclusion into a prerequisite conditionality for signing a treaty which is so important politically and geopolitically for all of us. The signature, in other words, the signature of that treaty by this way of uh, playing with the rule of law became hostage of the fate of a single person. This is a former prime minister. So, in a way which, in the end, uh, speaks for avoiding the judicial route for finding a solution to this affair, you know, and replace the judicial route not only with a political route, but with a political blackmail. So, uh, this is a frame in which I invited Mr. Obikhod to, as a representative of the civil society in uh, Ukraine, to give us the views on that case, but not a judge's view, because he cannot speak as a judge and we are not a court, I repeat it, but a view from the inside of the Ukrainian civil society and a view from the perspective of the destiny of that country who opted for European integration and who is kept at the doors of the European Union, I would say, in order to end by coming back to the title of this meeting, on the expenses of credibility of the European institutions and of the European idea. So, Mr. Bichot, you have the floor. It, it will be in, in Russian, so you have English number two and 22 is uh, Romanian. And Russian, will, you'll hear straight. Uh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be present here and to take part in this very interesting debate in this uh, beautiful conference hall and this wonderful building which we from uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian side and from far away from Ukraine we see as a bulwark of uh, democracy. This is a place where we hope to see the best examples of justice, of the rule of law, uh, not in terms only of the fate of individuals, but in terms of the destinies of entire countries and nations, so both on individual and geopolitical scale. I'm one of those um, Ukrainian non-governmental experts who have uh, courage uh, to uh, accuse uh, the European institutions, the European Union institutions, uh, in uh, some sort of short-sightedness and lack of justice. I would... Uh, actually, uh, I'm not saying accusing them. I'm saying like reproaching it to them. W what we reproach to the European politicians and European institutions uh, that they... Uh, use and pursue the policy of uh, double standards and uh, 
towards the events that have been taking place in Ukraine in the recent past. I would uh, emphasize from the onset that we are very grateful uh, and we appreciate a lot the um, general and overall welcoming and friendly attitude from the European Union. Nevertheless, we cannot help noticing these double standards. And these double standards need to be addressed in the wake of the first speech of the first uh, case we have heard of this morning. The policy of the double standards is unfortunately focused on one single person in Ukraine. And everything boils down to one individual in this country. The destiny of the former Prime Minister of Ukraine is being, seems to be the focus of uh, everybody's attention. Maybe two or three people from her direct environment who are only mentioned or for the reason uh, that they play some shadow role in uh, the case which is that of Mrs. Timoshenko. The Ukrainian experts uh, believe that this politics of the policy of double standards is one of those anachronic things that have been inherited from the past century. I would say that uh, this is a rudiment that has been uh, that has emerged uh, through the events of the past century, due to the Cold War, due to the existence of totalitarian state to the east of Europe. And perhaps without uh, imposing stringent rules, you couldn't have played with this part of the world. But now, in the 21st century, it is in no way justified and rightful to uh, put forward conditions towards our country, uh, the, the conditions which are similar to those of the Cold War. Now it has been two decades that Ukraine has embarked on the path of democratic development. It has been building the democratic society and many, as many others in the European Union. Of course, we still need to catch up, and in catching up, we still very need, much need the assistance of the European Union. It's now 20 years that we don't have political prisoners, political prosecutions, we have no dissidents, and, and we have no politically motivated trials. There is a democracy, rule of law, freedom of speech in this country. We have free elections and uh, other democratic values take place and develop progress swiftly. Of course, in um, every emerging democracy as in Ukraine, uh, there are a number of bottlenecks, a number of shortcomings. They do exist within the system of governance. Uh, they can be encountered within the judicial system. There is a corruption. There are fact of facts of corruption. But where, what is the society that is corruption-free? Of course, to Ukraine, as for to any young democracy, uh, assistance and uh, sound advice are needed, but what Ukraine doesn't need uh, is the ultimatum for uh, where it is white. It should be referred to as white where it's black. It should be referred to black and not the other way around. The criminal remains a criminal and uh, honest and uh, dignified politician is an honest politician. What do I mean by those uh, ultimatum-like preconditions. Everybody knows that Ukraine is now at the finalizing stage of signing the agreement on accession with the European Union. This is a very serious step towards turning in the coming years the full-fledged member of the European family. And now, Ukraine is, has been trying to comply with the conditions that have been put forward by the European community and um, it understands that uh, these conditions are real prerequisites uh, um, in order to, for the association agreement to be signed and then maybe in further outlook to become a member state of the European Union. At present, there are very few conditions that are being put by the European Union in order for the association agreement to be signed timely. November this year, 
a summit is scheduled where everybody, well, at least in Ukraine, and I know our European friends too, all very, very much wish to see this association agreement be signed. Almost all the prerequisites, almost all the conditions that uh, have been invoked by the European Union have now been complied with, have been fulfilled. Unfortunately, over the last month, the pressure has been increased on one single individual condition, which sounds paradoxical, and that, um, and that's where I see the uh, double standards of the European Union and European institutions, because this condition or precondition is the release of the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mrs. Yulia Tymoshenko, which has been indicted and convicted by the Court of Justice of the European Union. She has uh, gone through all the instances and the Supreme Court of the European Union and uh, is now in the process of uh, purging her term. You know. Not everybody knows probably that back in 2011, almost two years ago, one of the regional courts of justice of Kiev uh, has brought up an indictment towards Mr. Mrs. Timoshenko, the former, um, former Prime Minister of Ukraine, because of uh, the abuse of uh, her powers uh, and because of the order uh, that she gave to sign the a very deplorable and detrimental to Ukrainian interests uh, gas agreements which, uh, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, which led to a loss of uh, $6 billion per year, every year in the wake of the signature of this agreement, due to the excessive price of gas that had been set out in this, uh, in this agreement. This was the reason to launch this pursuit, and this was the reason, and uh, this was the ground for conviction. We often hear uh, the Ukrainian authorities being accused of what, what uh, they call here in Europe the selective justice and also the political motivation of prosecuting the former prime minister, and thirdly, l the lack of foundations, the lack of legal grounds to indict uh, Mrs. Timoshenko for the deeds that I've just described. Uh, now, uh, these claims towards Ukraine uh, are really framed in a very rigid and stringent way. And, um, only and only if, if Mr. Timoshenko is released, the association agreement may possibly be signed. Now, as soon as um, and since the subject matter of our today's talk is the double standards of, uh, in the policy of European institutions that um, treat in a various way the very identical phenomena in different EU, EU member states. I would like to give a few very simple answers to very complex is um, issues that uh, you bring arises in Ukraine. What is that, the selective justice? It is when the justice is done in a selective way, not as a rule, not as a matter of rule, but only when applied to a specific individual or to a limited number of cases or to a limited group of people which haven't pleased to the authorities for one reason or another. What, the, what is a sign of selective justice? One of the signs of selective justice is that the same justice is not applied to uh, similar individuals to which it should have been applied based on law. Everybody uh, rem uh, remains what uh, General Franco, uh, dictator General Franco uh, stated in the past. He says something that Laws to enemies, everything to friends, meaning that the selective justice once upon a time took place in not only in Ukraine but also in the Western Europe. We in Ukraine, we are th those who are not members to the U Yulia Tymoshenko and her partners' party, we all know for sure that the Ukraine case of Yulia Tymoshenko is in no way the case of selective justice. In Ukraine, over the years of the uh, Thursday in presidential seat on the, uh, or then 
Over the three years of uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Yanukovych in his presidential term, quite a number of members of the same party that Mr. Yanukovych belongs to have been uh, charged and indeed convicted on these charges. I can name those people. So these uh, accusations and these convictions have not been taking place on the party adherence basis. Uh, the uh, spokesman of the uh, head of the Crimean parliament, you know that we have an autonomous republic, uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, the uh, uh, president of this parliament has been convicted, Mr. Galitsky, uh, the head of the Ministry of Employment of Ukraine, Mr. Volga, uh, the head of the Ministry of uh, Finance in uh, Ukraine, have all been convicted. What does it mean? It means that the penal code and penal laws are not only applied to Mrs. Timoshenko and her proponents. Many other officials uh, have been charged and uh, convicted, and those belong to other party. Now, if in Europe um, uh, selective justice has been qualified as such, and you, uh, in cases when opponents should in no case be charged and accused, this is a total legal nonsense. This is something that doesn't meet the legal requirements or doesn't comply with the role of law. Even in the Middle Ages, the Pope wouldn't have been granting indulgences on this principle. I mean, principle of adherence to the opposition's people are equal uh, in front of the law. This is something that is uh, uh, set out in the Declaration on Human Rights, let alone the Ukrainian Constitution. It's the good God that has created them equal. And the same applies to the oppositioners. The second claim that is being brought up from, by the European politicians is the political motivation of the political case of the election political case against the Prime Minister Simoshenko. What is that political motivation and what are political motives? Uh, probably they are referring to the situation when the authorities set up or, or initiate the prosecution of political opponents out of political revenge or in order to remove them from political scenes and uh, from political scenes that as competitors. The authors of such version of the European Union probably mean President Yanukovych, who they believe gave orders uh, to prosecute the former Prime Minister Timoshenko uh, when um, uh, um, or at least to, to investigate her actions when she concluded this uh, largely detrimental gas contract with Russia and to bring her to accounts. No, indeed, Mrs. Yulia Tushimashenko is a political opponent to the current uh, president. But does it really mean that the political charges brought against her have political motivations? We, Ukraine experts, believe that no. If there is a crime, uh, then of uh, the deeds and actions of any individual which is suspected as an author of a crime investigation is to be held. And if suspicions are grounded, then this person should be held accountable for the crime he or she has committed. These are very simple legal truths and which are very respectful of the, uh, of the names of those who are being judged in uh, uh, these countries. We, uh, we can't indeed put the courage in front of the horse in this process. The main or uh, cornerstone is the uh, crime. If there is a crime, regardless of whether the criminal is a friend or an enemy of president or of the uh, uh, current power, he or she should be judged. So the political motivation may only take place when we really can prove there is an innocent person who is an opponent to the uh, political power that is being prosecuted on this revenge grounds. And in any other cases, the, any responsible government should uh, provide for all the legal, uh, legal procedures uh, needed to politically, uh, needed to investigate and bring to the court the person who is being suspected. And the th third 
widely heard statement in the European Union, as many believe that uh, uh, Mrs. Yulia Tymoshenko has taken a political decision when concluding this contract, this agreement with Russia, the gas contract, uh, meaning that there is no uh, criminal component to, to what she has done. There is only a political component. But we uh, can also argue that judges and courts precisely believe uh, in order to be able to distinguish between these two, between these two uh, cases. In this particular case, the, Mrs. Timoshenko has uh, faked the decree by the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine, because, as you may remember, the uh, Cabinet of Ministers has refused, has rejected the order uh, to sign uh, the contract. So she gave the orders directly to the head of the gas company of Ukraine, alleging that there was a, a consent, that there was another exchange from the chemical stores, there was a fake uh, uh, signature, and then she also, uh, she also argued that there was a meeting, the meeting that never took place, so the cabinet of ministers whereby th th such decision was taken, was adopted. Moreover, she threatened officials to sack them if she, they were not to sign this agreement. So all the signs and uh, all the uh, clear evidences to uh, the existence of a, uh, a criminal violation, they have been flagrant. And like I said, for the years that have elapsed, uh, Ukraine have been obliged to pay the excessive price for gas to Russia even those years when this gas was needed. So come back to our double standards. The, uh, double standards can be illustrated uh, in a, also in a very flagrant way, and uh, the uh, comparison, and through the comparison of the case of Mrs. Timoshenko and the former Prime Minister of Romania, Minister Anastasi. He was also in, convicted last year, and the Supreme Court of Romania has. Uh, uh, brought up a verdict of two years in jail uh, for uh, the alleged corruption deeds, corruption acts Mr. Nastasi has been involved in. Many has been saying that this case has also been politically motivated, saying that it was a political prosecution. What was the attitude of political institutions and in uh, European Union at large to the case of uh, Mr. Nastasi? This indeed is a very clear and flagrant case of how these double standards, of how these divergent approaches are being applied by the same institutions. I won't be quoting here reports by the, and statements by the European Commission. Nevertheless, these statements have incorporated those assessments by the European Commission, uh, whereby it uh, believes that the, uh, what has been done by the uh, Romanian judicial system is an achievement of the Romanian justice, whereby where, where is the, what is, has been done by Ukrainian justice uh, is once again a, a selective justice and something that would necessitate uh, the steps of pardon. Well, talking about pardon, then in the case of the former uh, Prime Minister of Romania, uh, the European institutions have been insisted on, the, on uh, no pardon being possible. European Commission states that uh, the recommendations of the uh, uh, European Commission have brought to light the first anti-corruption convictions, including that of the former Prime Minister. And what is it? Whether in Romania the conviction of the former Prime Minister is an example of good functioning, of good operating justice. In Ukraine, the same case is qualified as an example of failing justice. At the same time, it, it is being said that measures should be taken, the judicial and legal measures, so that to avoid negative criticism, negative uh, highlighting on the uh, part of press in Romania as uh, to the case of conviction of the foreign prime minister, as far as uh, Ukraine and Mrs. Timoshenko is concerned, that it is quite the opposite. 
the mass media statements are being fully supported only if they side with Mr. Mrs. Timoshenko. Mrs. Timoshenko's friends support support uh, and uh, friends and um, uh, political party members enjoy the full support of the European Commission. Why it, it so happens that answers could be only found in Brussels. We can only guess in Ukraine that some people see it as not very beneficial to the European Union the fact that the association agreement is signed, and some people try to undermine the signature of this agreement. When in Ukraine we witness to this unfair approach when black things are qualified as white ones by European politicians, it goes without saying that it leads to criticism among the public, large public, among all the sound people as to uh, the uh, European attitude towards the Secretary's office in Ukraine. Where are the crossroads in Ukraine these days? We will either move towards uh, the partnership to, with the customs union in Russia, and in this case we'll drift away from the European civilization closer to the East, or it will side with Europe. Who will help Ukraine in going for one or another option. Very few months remain before the summit. The heads of the European institutions now clearly refer to the possibility of the situation whereby the Ukraine will not join the European Union within the coming decade unless this association agreement is signed right now. We understand the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people have become hostages to the fate of one single individual. But those who are addressing geopolitical issues shall not be uh, bargaining for the destinies of entire states based on an unjustified support to one single individual politician which unfortunately has been recognized as, recognized as guilty by the Euro judicial court in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, it is an important case that is an interesting case. Probably this kind of opinions you have expressed here are heard in Ukraine. But unfortunately, they are not so much heard here in Brussels. And this is not because you do not come here to express them, but because you are not invited to come and express them. Um, and I think that all opinions have the right to be expressed and heard, mainly when these opini opinions concern such a sensitive topic, a topic which is a condition for the signature, in our case in next November, of a, such an important agreement, which is important for the European Union, I would say, from my perspective, because it's about our border with a Euro-Asiatic world. And certainly when I heard President Yanukovych at Euronews staying aside of President Lukashenko of Belarus, stating that for Ukraine the choice, the clear choice is not for the Euro-Asiatic uh, Union, but for the European Union, I understood that the ball is in the European Union's court first and foremost. Definitely reforms are to be done, but reforms are to be done everywhere, including in the European institutions, including in the European countries. I want to tell you, before we collect some questions, that, and to remind you, that both Ukraine, and not both, Ukraine and the member state of the European Union are all members of the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe is officially considered to be guardian of democracy, rule of law, 
and human rights. So from this point of view, Germany and Ukraine have the same credentials in terms of rule of law. Of course, nobody is perfect. And we could say that uh, perhaps deficiencies are more or deeper in Ukraine than in Germany. But both belong to the same family, which means that we cannot speak about one as being the example of uh, rule of law and democracy and about the others of being the opposite. Second point which I'd like to make. Being members of the Council of Europe, and by the way, the European Union, after the Lisbon Treaty, has signed the European Convention on Human Rights, thus becoming also linked to the Council of Europe. So, the, as members of the Council of Europe, if something is wrong with the rule of law in one state, we could address that institution and mainly the European Court on Human Rights. So, I simply do not understand why do we speak, I think it's again about double standards. On one hand, we speak about the respect for the rule of law, and on the other hand, we breach the rule of law by going, by substituting ourselves to the system of the Council of Europe. If we are respectful to the international this time rule of law, we should follow the decisions of the Council of Europe, and we should address the institutions of the Council of Europe, namely the European Court on Human Rights, and wait for that court to give its decision and enlighten us. But we do not do so. And I got an amazing answer for somebody saying that it will take time. So if justice takes time, let's make it faster. And let's intervene politically in the judiciary system. So because the European Court of Human Rights normally moves slowly because it's about evidences, it's about deep judgments, because justice is slow, let's move politically fast without caring about justice. Third point. As you know, Ukraine is not a member of the European Union. So, from this point of view, there is no legal basis for the European Union to intervene in the internal affairs of Ukraine. The only legal basis for such an intervention would be the association treaty, the association agreement. Because within the association agreement, we introduced provisions which are going to help us to move in a convergent way. In other words to determine Ukraine, to take on board our values, our institutions, our regulations, and to implement them in Ukraine. So if we are respectful to the rule of law, we should bring into force the agreement, and then based on that agreement, to ask Ukraine to behave. But we have agreed something which, as any agreement presupposes a balance of rights and duties, and then, before bringing to force that agreement, we unilaterally ask Ukraine to fulfill obligations which have no legal source except our mighty attitude. Mm -hmm. So, what is about the power of the right and the power of the might? Let's make it clear. What is the legal basis for on which we ask Ukraine to do this and that and that. There is no legal base. We need a legal base? Yes, we need. And if we need that, let's sign the treaty. Let's sign the treaty and then we are going to ask Ukraine to behave in accordance with the treaty. Isn't it this rule of law? I think so. Isn't it a double standard when we say, okay, we are going to accomplish our obligations inscribed in the agreement only after the agreement is into force, while Ukraine should accomplish its obligation before the treaty is into force, I think it's a double standard. And anyhow, I think it's a breach of the rule of law. And... Uh, mm, my last, uh, my, my, my last point, uh, maybe 
it's uh, also about this, uh, this standard and it brings me back to direct evidences and circumstantial evidences. I must remind you, and this is official, that the former Romanian Prime Minister Nastase was convicted on the basis of circumstantial evidences only. This is undisputed. As far as we know, Mrs. Timoshenko was convicted on the basis of direct evidences. I don't know if these evidences are good or not, if these evidences are relevant or not, if they are genuine or forged, if they were rightly interpreted or not. We do not know. Therefore, we cannot say she is guilty. And I would love to see her uh, at large because I love to see everybody at large. But here it's a clear, you know, double standard issue. On one hand, when it's about direct hard evidences, we say these are not good, we are not interested in that. In the other case, when it is about the circumstantial evidences, and we discussed before about, if we heard our uh, Maltese uh, colleague, uh, guest, speaking about that, we have nothing to say but that these evidences were, circumstantial evidences were good enough. And uh, I would just, I have in front of me some quotations from, and I, I, let, let me read it briefly and then I'll turn to, to, the, to the auditorium. It is critical the acceptance of judicial decisions. This requires the whole of the political class to form a consensus to refrain from discrediting judicial decisions by commenting them in a critical way. So, it is critical the acceptance of judicial decisions. If it's critical the acceptance of the judicial decision, we should accept the judicial decision of the Ukrainian courts, I believe. But this recommendation belongs to the, the European Commission and European Council, but it is not addressed to Ukraine. I give you another one and I stop here. Uh, the Commission was concerned that previous judicial decision could be overturned through pardons. So, a judicial decision could be overturned through pardons, thus affecting the credibility of justice. So the pardon, the act of grace, graziera for the Romanians, is something which would revert the judiciary decisions, would undermine we overturn the judicial process. Number one, pardon is about mercy, it's not about justice. Pardon is not justice. Pardon is about mercy. Okay, mercy could be one of the most uh, detestable uh, qualities, as Albert Camus put it, because mercy is opposing justice sometimes, and this is not my words and my, not my philosophy, but Albert Camus' philosophy, that mercy is one of the most detestable uh, virtues because it is against justice. But I think that mercy is, however, a virtue, a human virtue, a human value, and certainly it should be applied wherever and wherever uh, necessary. It could be also an expression of political wisdom, and certainly I could think in these terms of political wisdom when thinking about pardon and Timoshenko's case. But the Commission said it crystal clear that the judicial decision could be overturned through pardons and therefore recommended to be avoided, but not in Mrs. Timoshenko's case, in some other cases. And let me uh, say that this is a political intervention in, in the judiciary. In this is a political intervention. And certainly if a country receives such political intervention from Brussels, the local politician in that country feel free also to use political as a justice. Why not? If we are told, if a political leader in a country is told to intervene in order to get some outcome from the judiciary, he will intervene. Why not? in order to solve his problems with the opposition. 
Because certainly anyone does not like opposition very much. Everybody likes more the political friends rather than those opposing him or her. So if somebody is asked, and I'm not speaking now about the Ukrainian case, but about other cases, if somebody is asked to intervene politically in order to correct the justice and to make the justice so-called more efficient, then certainly the national political leaders would intervene in order to solve their disputes with their opponents. It's the same nature of the intervention, a political intervention in the judiciary system. So, uh, as I said, I, I stop here. Do we have some questions? Okay. Uh, are there any questions in the room? I will favor, uh, yes. Uh, do you? No. Do you have a paper? Okay. Uh, okay, please. So, um, okay, we'll, uh, but, but uh, sorry, let me say uh, something more. Why are those political st double standards? This is very important. Why do we, uh, do we uh, have to f face double standards? Not because people have double thinking, but because there are polit different political interests. And this is what I wanted to say in respect of Ukraine, straightforward. And this is some, well, I don't know, maybe the case of uh, Mr. Timoshenko is unjust. Mrs. Timoshenko is unjust. Maybe uh, she was not uh, prosecuted and trialed correctly. Uh, and for sure, the judiciary in Ukraine, according to my opinion, has to be deeply reformed dramatically reformed. Yes, yes, yes. But this is not the main issue. The main issue is that some of us do not want Ukraine to be too close, not to say inside the European Union. This is the main issue. This is the main issue. And we have to dare to say it, even if some would be extremely upset by such statements. Certainly, we, we, we uh, see shortcomings in the Ukrainian judiciary. And certainly we say the truth when we speak about those shortcomings. But let me, let me quote a saying which says, the truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. Yes, we say the truth that Ukraine has to improve its judiciary system, but we say this truth with a bad intent. And this is more than any lie we can invent. The bad intent is to push Ukraine eastwards. This is a bad intent. And I'm afraid that in the end, if we keep on this course, we might become successful. How? By decreasing, by demolishing the credibility of the European idea in the minds and in the souls of the Ukrainians. And not only. So... Um, let me, let me, uh, this is okay. Um, I will, there are in English some, and I will uh, read them. Do you think, for you, Mr. Obikot, mm -hmm. do you think that the Ukrainian public opinion perceived the double standard used in the case of Ukrainian European integration? So, if the ordinary people, I understand, are aware of that. If yes, did it affect, or is it likely to affect it in the future? the pro-European feeling of the Ukrainians. So uh, my understanding of this question is, do you think that really you ordinary Ukrainians care about these double standards? And if they care, they might lose their confidence in the European Union? Well, uh, it will be my pleasure to answer this question. Uh, the trouble is that the situation is pretty complex in Ukraine. It's not a homogenous country. It is basically divided into two parts. Uh, one is eastwards uh, and another one is uh, uh, westwards. And one is drawn to the east and another one is drawn to the west. And this, uh, this issue has been existing for centuries. Uh, and it is very acute. Currently, if you ask the ordinary Ukrainians, they think in a different way, unfortunately. It, it is a very fragile balance between the Ukrainian society. If uh, something overweighs, something of a negative, adverse uh, nature overweighs on, uh, this balance, then they will go eastwards, towards Russia, and it will suffice 
for a very little positive thing to emerge in a part of Europe, then uh, their feelings will be going towards Europe. It's a very fragile question indeed. The, of course, the uh, a negative attitude from the representatives of the European Union towards the judiciary case of Yulia Tymoshenko may become uh, the drop that will shift the balance and that will um, move to the, uh, some negative thinking in the minds of Ukrainian population. Uh, On the Tymoshenko's case as being a selective justice situation. How do you, because uh, I, I assume that uh, those that who put the question thinks, and I can confirm that, that the general perception here is that this is an example of uh, a selective justice. So this is a perception. It might be wrong, but this is a perception. How do you explain, why do you think that so many people perceive this like that? Well, um, I believe that th this perception is the result of, uh, of a massive, uh, massive campaign in the mass media. And this mass media has been harnessed by the political friends and proponents of Mrs. Timoshenko, both in Ukraine and in Europe. These people are very professional in attempting to Paint Mrs. Timoshenko's image as the one of uh, the uh, unrightfully illegally convicted, prosecuted, uh, ill-treated uh, on political grounds. But it is not the case if you uh, look at it through uh, the realistic prism. I don't think that many people in this audience know anything about the penal case of Mrs. Timoshenko. If they were to get an insight on this penal case, it will take a longer time, they would certainly arrive to their own conclusions. Now, we, knowing this subject matter from inside, having investigated, examined, studied it thoroughly, we can state that no selective justice took place in the case of Mrs. Timoshenko at any stage of her investigation or trial. We didn't mention that besides holding Mrs. Timoshenko accountable for the power abuse and for the gas contract with Russia, there are also other cases um, under which the Charges are pressed against Mrs. Timoshenko, such as the suspicions of involvement in assassination of one of the members of parliament in Ukraine, such as many other crimes. And um, we can talk at length about them, but it's not the subject the matter of our uh, today's talks. But these are real facts, and this is something that affects human minds. So, Mazur, two questions, but I will uh, put them together. Uh, do you think that there is a real risk for Ukraine to, I think, move eastwards and to opt for the Euras Eurasian Union if its European integration process is procrastinated? So do you think that there is a real risk for Ukraine to move eastwards if uh, this process is procrastinating? And the other one is... Um, how uh, does the Ukrainian uh, people could stay very long? No. Uh, do you consider that Ukraine can remain for a lo very long period in a neutral position between the EU and the Eurasian Euro Union? So there are two, to my mind, complementary questions. So if you think that there is a real uh, possibility for Ukraine if uh, keep kept waiting to move eastwards, and uh, if uh, this process will be delayed, Ukraine is able to stay neutral, not to make any option for a while. How long do you think? Uh, you know that uh, this world changes very rapidly. The borders move. Uh, the nation states disappear and emerge. You see what is happening in the far in the Middle East. 
in the north of Africa where the states that were stable, that used to be stable for centuries, and so the world is changing strenuously. We will try to look into the future. The young and very young people sitting in this, in this, in this conference room, in this audience, will be living in Europe, which will might one day may incorporate both Ukraine and Russia. But before it happens, we will have to go through a number of crises. We will have to go through a number of painful events. And in my opinion, it's of course my personal uh, individual opinion. My conviction, it may so happen that in the coming years, Ukraine can indeed opt for Russia. But then we will be inevitably and inexorably together in a, a further outlook because, because there is no other option in this rapidly changing world. You can only exist by being united. I see you, yes, please. Please, but uh, concise yeah. as possible. Yeah. Um, I would rather speak in Romanian. I don't want to contradict you, but there is clear evidence that the trials against Yulia Timoshenko are political. And it's the same for Romania as well. And I want to ask you a question. Why is it that the political rivals of the presidents in Romania and in the Ukraine are the ones going to jail? And why does this happen when their opponents uh, become uh, the rulers of a country. Uh, the ECHR ruled that the trial against Yulia Timoshenko in Ukraine was a political one. And I want to say that the European Commission condemned Russia for imposing the gas price that for the gas that it exports into the European Union. Mrs. Timoshenko was visited by MEPs, by a delegation of MEPs. So I want to ask, how can the European institutions counter Russia's influence in the Ukraine, except for the conclusion of this treaty? I believe, for me, it's very clear that they have to take political rights into account. Whether Mrs. Timoshenko abused her power or not, that's different but if the court in Strasbourg said that this it was a political trial I want to ask how how can the European institutions counter Russia's influence also with respect to Romania I don't know Mr. Nastase but I want to ask why there was no MEP visiting Mr. Nastase in jail why is this case discussed now here for the first time in the European Parliament? And congratulations for tackling this issue. Why is the political candidate, political rival of the president in R Romania, in uh, the one being sent to jail? I also want to say say that uh, the former security apparatus is very, still very influential in Romania. I see that the, the former uh, security services in Romania is uh, now coming back to life. So, why doesn't the European Parliament discuss these things? I don't understand. Thank you. Um... You asked several questions. Two matters that I want to bring out, and then I will leave my guest to clarify things. I won't answer one of your questions with your permissions, the first one more specifically, but what I want to say that is that in the case of Mrs. Timoshenko, there were observer, observers from European Union countries that uh, monitored the trial 
and gave us information. But in the case of Mr. Nastase, nobody gave us information. No ambassadors uh, were there, nobody to monitor the trial. So we have no information. A second specification. This is a fact. So the second specification is that in the case of Yulia Timoshenko, from the information that I have, the ECHR gave two rulings. One of them referred to the fact that uh, it was not fair to try Yulia Timoshenko uh, while she was detained. And I believe, with respect to human rights, that this was a correct decision. It was, in my opinion, a mistake to try her while she was detained. Uh, the second ruling of the ECHR was uh, was referring to the the complaint regarding the ill treatment applied to Yulia Timoshenko. The court did not talk about a fair trial. Did not talk about a political trial. the court will rule on that and I believe it's only fair to wait for a verdict there but after there is a ruling we can only hope and request that all of the parties comply with the decision uh, given by the ECHR we can have our own opinion certainly but we have to comply these are the two specifications that I wanted to make based on the information that I already have. Yet, I will. I will gladly. I will gladly clarify a couple of issues you have raised. We are coming back to the same point that to the to the statement that the trial has been politically motivated. There are two faces to this trial. Political and legal, and uh, if uh, actually you study thoroughly the legal motivations, the second drops out. There is an evidence to the existence of a criminal infringement, of criminal violation, and, and and this crime is something that has led to the decision that has been adopted by the court. And it's only afterwards that the issue of political prosecution has been raised. Uh, we all used to say that in order for politicians not to be protected politically, they shouldn't be committing true crimes, the penal violations. And as far as the ECHR, the indictment is concerned, or decision, ruling is concerned, I will compliment Mr. Sullivan. There was one trial in the Strasbourg court. One of them reviewed the detention the and versus trial and indeed the fact that the trial occurred during the detention and the second was addressing her complaint and about torture about ill treatment in the jail then uh, as far as the first question is concerned uh, uh, the european court of human rights uh, has ruled uh, that the detention was not justified and was not rightful because the judge who uh, took this decision to detain her, um, he uh, did it on the grounds that uh, Mrs. Timoshenko didn't treat the court in a respectful manner. But uh, indeed, she has sworn several times to uh, she has been uh, addressing the judge in a very offensive uh, manner. I won't be repeating her words. That is, words have been quoted by mass media. And of course, this is a serious infringement. But once again, again, according to the Convention on Human Rights, this is uh, the kind of behavior. There is no grounds for arresting, for detaining someone while in court. When the judge motivated his decision that this humiliating attitude towards the court was uh, the attempt to, to interfere in uh, the establishment of truth uh, during this court trial. Well, maybe uh, uh, de facto it was right, but de jure uh, it was really illegal. The officials of the European Court of Human Rights, when commenting the ruling of the court, it happened only very recently, the 13th of April, 
they have clearly specified that it was not about political prosecution of Mrs. Uh, Timoshenko. And the second question about tortures and ill treatment. The claims by Mrs. Timoshenko that she has been subjected to bad treatment or tortures have been recognized by the court as uh, unjustified. And the thing, the last thing, what the European needs to do in order to help Ukraine, this is the, uh, the address, the, this is the, um, the question that should be addressed to experts and politicians, the political leaders of the European Union. What we in Ukraine wish and is that this historical and turning point in November, the Vilnius summit, would end up in signing the association agreement, which will open up a broad road for reforms in this country, which are already going on, but will, will be done then in more depth and will open up further opportunities to demand from Ukraine under the association agreement this time round the respect of democratic values and other conditions which will become to us familiar, close conditions and not those that are imposed from abroad. Thank you. Um, this would conclude uh, our meeting. Let me just say a few more words. Um, a lot has been said. A lot is still to be said because there are so complicated issues that we cannot certainly go into all details in such a short time. But what I want to stress is the fact that we didn't discuss today about Mr. Dali, Mrs. Timoshenko or Mr. Nastasi. We have discussed about the credibility of our institutions and the credibility, therefore, of the European idea. Certainly we might be attracted by some uh, results. Certainly we want to reach as fast as possible our goals. But we should be faithful to our values because if we reach the goal on the expenses of our values by abandoning the values, this is a meaningless victory, and even more, a dangerous victory. Years ago, decades ago, in the United States, during the McCarthy's witch uh, hunting, a rather famous journalist, while dealing with the breaches of the laws and values in the name of justice and security and defense against the bad uh, communists and things like that, quoted a um, short dialogue from the Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It was a dialogue between Brutus and Cassio. And it sounded the evil Dear Cassio, is not in the stars. The evil is in us. Let me paraphrase that. The evil is not in the European idea. The evil is not in our beautiful resolutions. The evil is not even in our institutions. But the evil in those who serve those institutions. The evil is in those who implement those resolutions. The evil is in us who speak on behalf of the values while breaching these values. And indeed, if you look around on the walls, you could see a lot of advertisements, a lot of uh, papers, you know, speaking about... Uh, Many conferences here, hearings, uh, round tables on beautiful topics. How could we protect uh, the seals uh, in the cold waters? Uh, how could we solve the problem in the Seychelles? How do, could we uh, you know, uh, deal with uh, the Star Wars? But the devil is in this which might look as being details. There is a de devil and the devil is in us. The evil is not in the stars, the evil is in us. So I hope, though I know that many are very upset 
with this meeting. I know that many uh, wanted it very much not to take place. I know that some will perhaps try to express uh, further on their discontent with the fact that we dared to uh, say in a certain way that the king is naked. But only if we dare to say that the king is naked, we could have the hope that one day it will be properly dressed. And we are here simply because we want the European idea to live and we do not want it to die. But if we go on like that, the perspective is not at all attractive and source of optimism. I thank you very much, all of you, for being present here for two hours and more. I thank you the guests who took the time to be here and talk to us. Uh, I thank you all those who participated to the organization of this event. It's not perhaps a glamorous event, but it is an event which I hope could inspire for deeper and more meaningful discussions and most important to better political decisions in the near future. I thank, of course, the interpreters who worked hard in order to help us to communicate. So thank you very much. Have a nice day and have a good luck. Thank you. Certainly, you will notice that uh, there is a small, as we say, networking reception outside. So you may set, you are most ha wor um, warmly invited to stop and to have a glass and have a sandwich and talk. Este o recepție afară și vă invităm să. There is a reception outside, and you are all invited to take part in it.